What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning. We're going to read this morning from Romans chapter 16. And um, Romans, for those of you who don't know, uh, I remember um, once someone told me, uh, a mentor of mine told me this, when you preach, never assume that people know. So you never, go, you, never you, know, you don't start by saying, of course we all know this, because at least half of us are going to go, I didn't know that. So I'm not going to assume that we know anything this morning. I want to say Romans was written by a guy called Paul. And he was in Corinth at the time that he wrote this. And it's a letter. It's a letter that he wrote to the church or the the Jews or the believers in in a place called Rome. That's why the book is called Romans. It was originally written as a letter. And for me, I was thinking about the letter that's being written here. And as we get to Romans 16, some of what I'm saying right now is going to make a lot more sense. But around Christmas time every year in my wife's family, it never happened in my family before I met my wife, but in her family and all of her extended family, every household will send out a Christmas letter. And apparently it's a tradition that many people actually do. They send out a Christmas card to all the extended family and friends and in it there's a letter that kind of says, hey, this is what our year's been like. This is everything that's happened over the last year. And these are the things that we're looking forward to for the next year. So I want you to imagine that this is not just a book of the Bible that we've kind of maybe read before and and it's not just sort of a passage of Scripture, but I want you to imagine that this is a letter that Paul has written. And I want you to imagine, imagine you this week going to the letterbox. No doubt this week, many of us are still receiving letters through snail mail and we're still going to the letterbox and finding the occasional Christmas card from our 65-year-old aunt or our 65-year-old whoever it is. And we're finding these things called letters in our mailbox. They still actually occur. I know Australia Post only delivers three days a week now. But occasionally we get a letter in the mailbox. I want you to imagine as I'm reading this that you've received a letter. Now we're right at the end of this letter here. Okay, and this is what it says. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church of that place there in Centuria. I ask you to receive her in in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give, give her any help she may need from you. For she has been a great help to many people, including me. Greet Priscilla, Priscilla and Aquila and my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friends, Eponetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet... Andronicus and Junius, my relatives who have been in prison with me, they are outstanding among the apostles and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampliatus, whom I love in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ and my dear friend Starchius. Greet Apellus, tested and approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the household of Astibullus. Greet Herodon, my relative. I apologise for anyone who knows the correct pronunciation of these. I really wish there was a few Bobs, Marys and Matts. <laughs> Greet those in the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphinia and Trophosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. On and on and on it goes and then it says this. I urge you, brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching that you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites by smooth talk and flattery. Uh, they deceive their minds of the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I am full of joy over you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent and what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Let's pray. God, I I just want to thank you so much for just being here and present with us. We acknowledge that you really are the creator of the universe. We put our faith, our trust and our hope in you. 
We thank You so much for Jesus and everything that He did. And as we delve into this this morning, I pray that You'll give us greater understanding of what it means and how we can apply it to our life. God, if anything good comes out of my mouth this morning that draws people closer to You, I acknowledge that it was You. May You receive glory and honour for that. If anything comes out of my mouth that could bring confusion or whatever, God, I acknowledge it's me getting in the way and I repent before my brothers and sisters. May You receive all glory, honour, praise, due to Your name in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm reading this passage and I'm thinking to myself, what the heck is going on in this passage, right? And I really, as I was sitting and I was preparing around about a week ago for this this message, and I've really felt like the Lord was encouraging me strongly to preach from this chapter. And I'm reading Romans 16, I'm going, Lord, I'm really struggling to find anything that's of worth here. It's one of those passages where it just mentions person's name after person's name after person's name. And generally how I read those passages in the Scripture is like this. I uh, can't pronounce those blokes' names. Oh, good stuff. Let's move on to the good stuff. Now, it's one of those passages. I just literally lost a page of my Bible. This is what happens when you have children. (laughs) All right. So as as I'm reading this, I'm trying to figure out, God, what is it that you could possibly have to say in this passage? And I, I tell you what, I really in a moment felt rebuked by the Holy Spirit because He said this to me. He said, who wrote the Word of God? And in that moment, I was reminded that the Holy Spirit was the one who inspired every word that was penned and every word that was written down in the Word of God. And this is what I felt the Lord say to me. I felt like the Lord was saying to me, do you really think that I would waste my words? Man, what an incredible revelation as I began to realise that every single word that is written in these Scriptures is not just there for fill. The Lord doesn't need to fill out here. You know, we, we've all, many of us have written a uni assignment. And you know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about Phil. You're looking going two and a half thousand words, talking about 300 that are useful. The other 1,200, we're going to have to fill that up. I don't know whether your Christmas letters might look like that or uni reports, whatever it is, business reports. Either way, we all know what it's like to fill out a page. The Holy Spirit doesn't need to fill out a page. He's not sitting there going, oh, it's only going to be 400 pages. That's not going to impress people for 2,000 years. Better buff this thing out a little bit. Better stretch it. See if I can add a few useless things in there. Not one single word that's written in the Word of God is useless. It all contains an incredible purpose to bring life, to bring direction, to bring correction. So as I'm reading this, I'm asking myself, what is this all about? You know, Christmas is nearly upon us. Many of us will know that. Some of us live indoors without a TV and didn't realise that it was December the 20th today, only five days to Christmas. But Christmas, is an, it's, it's, it's a bizarre time, isn't it? Because as most of us who have lived a few years would know, for many of us, Christmas is a great time of year. But we also know for some people, Christmas can be a bit iffy. Christmas can be one of those times where they're reminded of how lonely they actually are. I wonder this Christmas, how many people are going to be waking up on Christmas morning to an empty house for whatever reason. And when they're thinking, what am I going to have for Christmas lunch? They're looking to what's left in their cupboards. I wonder this Christmas, how many people don't have the opportunities that some of us in this room have. that don't have the family to go to. They don't have those friends to go to. It's the little things that we take for granted, like being in the house of God, like the friends and family that we have, that often mean that we just think everyone has what we have. But for those of us who have lived enough years, we've seen it before, right? We know that there's people like that around us. Heck, there's probably people like that living in your street right now. I was thinking about this passage and I was reflecting on the the fact that at Christmas for some people it can be quite lonely. And I realised this, of all the people in Paul's life, why did he mention these people's name? Like what was so significant about these people in Paul's life that 
forever, their names would now be written down in the Word of God. That even 2,000 years later, in a small church in Brisbane, we're still small by the way, we've got to double in size next year. Come on church, let's grow. That in a small church in Brisbane, that we would be speaking about their names and speaking about who these people are. And I realised as I was reading this, that true friends are much rarer than what we actually think. That, that as Paul's writing this, that he's writing to those people that he considers dear to him. That he's writing to those people that he's like, you know what, I love these people. These people matter. And what I realised is this, the Holy Spirit actually cares about you having good friends. The Holy Spirit not only cares about it, He considers it so valuable that He allowed these words to be written down in His Word to remind us that friendship matters that true friends matter. You know, as you consider all the friends in your life, how many right now, as you consider them, can you just come to your mind, just names that start coming into your mind? Now, I'm pretty average with names and I thank God every day that I live in Australia that we have the word mate. (laughs) Because everyone's my mate. But when it comes to names, it's pretty easy to remember the names of the people who are most important to you. It's pretty easy to remember the names of those who have done things in your life that are significant, who have done things in your life that matter. And as we look at Paul's writings here, as we look at him writing this letter, I want you to imagine him going and penning these words and going, no, no, you don't understand. These people matter. Like I can name them by name because of what they have done. I can name them by name because of who they are. And this morning, I wanna have a look at what the qualities of these people are that made them so incredible that Paul would remember them by name, that that God, the Holy Spirit would say, what these guys did is so valuable. I want it to be remembered by people forever. What is the friendship that these guys had and how did they outwork it? What is the the measures of true friendship that's used here? And so I pulled out a few of the words that Paul used. And I wanted to talk this morning about what true friendship looks like according to what Paul valued. The first word that I saw him mention was when he talks about people who are his co-workers. Those who worked alongside him. And I looked at what this word co-workers meant. And it's broken up into Greek in two words. One, where we, we translate it as co-workers. And today, when you think about your co-workers, we don't often think about people that are that close to us, do we? We talk about work colleagues and then we talk about friends. In fact, they say you should have some sort of separation between your work colleagues and who your friends are as well so you can have that time to relax and all this sort of thing. So when we see co-workers, it'd be pretty easy for us just to go, oh yeah, they're his co-workers in Christ. You just read it and you look over it and you don't think too much of it. But when you look at the word that's broken up into two words, the word for co, if you actually look at it, means united together. The person who is stitched close together to you. The idea and the concept was not just somebody who's, oh yeah, that's me, that's my work colleague. Yeah, that's old Bob down the road, mate. Yeah, no, he drives the crane down there at the work site. Yeah, no, Bob, he's a good bloke, mate. He just crane and all, yeah, me co-worker. It's not that sort of a co-worker. It's the sort of co-worker that is intimately stitched close to you. It's a sort of co-worker that you're doing everything together. And I want you to think about your own life right now. I want you to reflect on your own life in this moment. I want you to think about those co-workers in your life. Have you ever had that work colleague that just got you? You know what I'm talking about? You've worked alongside someone that was just so easy to work with. It wasn't, an, it wasn't a hard thing to go to work and spend time with them. Maybe they had the same work ethic as you. Maybe as you think about that person, it's the same sort of, it's a person who worked hard and played hard. It was easy enough for you to be able to spend time outside of work with them. They're the sort of person that would stay back late with you, not because they were being paid, but just because they valued who you were. You know that sort of loyalty of a, of a good workmate? And you don't even know how to describe them because our English language becomes weak when we're trying to describe these things. They're the sort of 
work colleague that just, that made your day that little bit easier. It doesn't matter what context or what environment you were working in, they got it. And you need to understand the context and the environment that Paul was working in. When he's writing this letter, he's on his third missionary journey. And Paul's missionary journeys, well, they didn't go quite as planned all the time. He often ended up in some pretty dire situations. I'm not gonna lie, he did get beaten to within an inch of his life a few times. He did end up in prison. Uh, he did end up shipwrecked and bitten by poisonous snakes. But apart from that, his missionary journeys were pretty smooth. Apart from being dragged into the town centres and having his name defamed and being spat on and beaten, apart from those little minor setbacks, his missionary journeys were pretty smooth. And so his co-workers, the ones that he's talking about, were the ones that didn't abandon him when all that was going on. His co-workers were the ones that were like, dude, I don't care if I have to get beaten with you. I'm standing with you on this one. His co-workers were the ones who were willing to stand beside him through thick and through thin. Let's be honest, how rare are those friends? Maybe Paul's times weren't that different to what our times were. In fact, I think about it like this. If you had something go horribly wrong in your life right now, I mean, you lost everything. How many friends would you be able to call that you know would be like, dude, come stay at my house. I got you covered. How many friends in your life do you know? You know what? The reality is you can probably name those friends because that's what Paul did. Those friends are much rarer than what we think. And the Holy Spirit values those type of friends in our lives. The ones that will stand through it with us through thick and thin. What about this when he talks about the people who are willing to risk their life for him? As you read it, it says they were willing to risk their life with me. For me. You know, the, uh, the, the closest example I could think of to this would be people who today would be in the military or even in the, the defence forces of any sort or the police or anything like that. Those guys who are, who are facing frontline battles. You know, I've, I've, um, my reference to this is obviously very historically accurate and you'll get a gauge of uh, my research capabilities. The movie 300. You guys all seen the movie, many of us will have seen the movie 300, but in the movie 300, um, Leonidas or whatever his name was, he's talking to this guy and he's talking about their defence strategy. And their defence strategy is you hold the shield to cover the shoulder to the knee of the man standing next to you. There's an absolute dependence and an absolute reliance that the person standing next to you is going to be protecting you and saving your life. That is an incredible sense of trust. That's an incredible sense of, man, right, how many people in here would you be like, you know what, if I went to war, if I went into a battle, this is the guy that I would want holding a shield standing next to me. Not the sort of guy that's gonna be like, dude, this is getting too hot and too heavy. I'm dropping the shield and running. You're on your own, man. I stood as long as I could. How many people do you know that are like, I will fall to the ground before I drop this shield? Man, that is a measure of friendship right there. Those people are so rare that I believe that the Holy Spirit wants us to consider those people in our life. I believe that the Holy Spirit says to us, I want you to remember these people by name. I want you to consider them. I want you to think about, God, how can I bless these people that are in my life? If war was to break out here, who would you want in the trenches with you? Can you name them? As you look at the speed dial on your phone, are they on your speed dial? What do you do to show them that you love them? Do they even know the place that they have in your life? And as we look on, I wanna look at one last one. The one where he talks about somebody being like his mother. I wanna talk about those pseudo families that we all have. When I was a kid, there was a, um, a great guy in my life whose name was Wade. We used to call him Uncle Wade. 
And he was like one of those pseudo uncles in my life. You guys, does anyone know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about those pseudo uncles? Man, he was so cool for me as a kid because he had a motorbike. He would ride his motorbike and he'd go, there you go, put the helmet on, we're going for a ride. And he would be in my mind flying around and we'd be like taking corners really fast. Realistically, I've looked back at some of the videos. He wouldn't have been going more than 15 kilometres an hour. But in my head, I was like on a spaceship, man. This thing was flying, right? And so those pseudo uncles that are in our life are there to, and are a blessing from God. And I remember him, even though I was like four or five years old, I still remember his name to this day. You know, we live in a world and in a society where families are pretty broken and pretty messed up, Right? And we live in a world where we've forgotten this very important fact that it takes a community to raise somebody. And as we think about those pseudo uncles and pseudo aunties in our life and cousins and whatever else it may be, how beautiful is a friendship when you can look somebody in the eye and go, you're more than just a friend now. You're like a brother. You're like a sister to me. You guys have those friendships in your life? Do you guys have those relationships in your life? I want to let you know that those relationships and friendships are a gift from the Holy Spirit who knows you intimately and who knows you well. You know why I know they're a gift from the Holy Spirit? Because how much does it hurt when you lose those friendships? Because we've all lost friendships like that, right? We've all had those friends that were so close and for whatever reason it's been lost or it's been broken or, or, or maybe even harder for us to take is that that person has passed away and all of a sudden it genuinely feels like there's a hole in your heart. And I want to let you know that those friendships well, God's way of letting you know He knows you. God's way of letting you know He loves you. And so as Christmas draws close to us, I want to ask you, who's on your list? Like if you were to write a letter, just like Paul did, who would be on your list that you would say, you know what? Greet this person. Send blessings to this person. This person matters. I mean, at this stage, Paul was incredibly well known throughout the region. It'd be essentially the equivalent of getting some incredibly famous person to tag you on their Instagram or their Facebook or something like that. Hashtag Simo. <laughs> yes, I've made it. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Paul, when he wrote these people's names, wanted everyone to know that they mattered, not just them. He wanted everyone in the church there to go, this is the sort of stuff that matters, it's rare. You know, I have another question for you. And the question is this, as Christmas draws close, whose list are you on? Like if somebody was to write a letter to, to City Point even. Whose list are you on? If somebody was to write a letter to your neighbourhood right now and to say, greet these people in the neighbourhood, would your name be on the list? Whose list are you on? You see, I wonder whether the Holy Spirit allowed this passage to last throughout time not just to remind us of the gift that He's given us of great friends, but to challenge us, to say, whose list are you on? Who are you that co-worker to? The one that you would stand with that person through thick and thin? Are you the sort of person that would say to somebody, listen to me, I don't care how hot or how heavy this battle gets, I will stand beside you until I fall. Who are you that pseudo uncle to? That pseudo cousin to? A pseudo mom or dad? And as Christmas approaches, 
and I'm reminded of the number of people in our neighbourhoods that are lonely. Are we on their list this Christmas? The list of people that they'd say, you know what, I'll remember their name for a very, very long time. This Christmas, we can challenge ourselves to get on somebody's list. To get on the list of a measure of true friendship or a measure of true love. You know, as I consider all of these values, (laughs) there's one friend that ticks all the boxes. There's a friend that's not just my co-worker. He was willing to die for me. (laughs) There's a friend that acts like a pseudo dad. (laughs) You might know his name. Some of you in here probably know him, but do you know him like I know him? (laughs) Do you know him like this list? I wonder, would you put the name Jesus on your list? The Jesus that says, I'll stand with you. I'll work hard with you. I promise you, I'll never leave you. The Jesus that says, I promise you, I'll never forsake you. The Jesus that says, no matter how hot, no matter how heavy this battle gets, I promise you, I'll stand beside you. This Christmas, do you know that Jesus is your friend? Friends, I want everyone just to close your eyes just for a moment.